So welcome back from that delicious lunch. And um, we'll try to liven things up a little here. I, again, want to thank the course sponsors. This has been a fantastic course. I know I've learned a lot. It's a great opportunity to interact with folks. Um, feel free to come up and ask a lot of questions and that sort of thing. Um, I got assigned um, a very difficult task, which is to debate the course director. Um, and I got assigned one side of the argument, but fortunately he made the fatal mistake of giving me the winning side. Um, so first I have to um, say my disclosures. So I have received FDA mandated TAVR training for both devices, both commercially available platforms, Medtronic and Edwards. Um, I've served as a consultant to Transaeric Medical and Medion Bio, and I have some research support that's shown. But most importantly, I'm an employee of the federal government, which if you were here last night, you heard me say that my views expressed here are not the official views of the federal government. Definitely not today. So this is where I work. This is the VA in San Francisco in a very nice location. Um, so first of all, the ground rules for this debate is that um, we are to carefully dissect the published evidence-based medicine literature to affirm our pre-established position and to discredit the opponent's position. <laughs> we are allowed to employ hyperbole and academic trickery to exaggerate any differences. And when rational arguments and humor falter, we attack our opponent's background, training, clinical skills, and academic credentials. <laughs> And if all else fails, we employ personal insult and simply declare victory. <laughs> so uh, a few further caveats in this debate. So randomized controlled uh, trial data are extremely scarce. I'll show you sort of the one trial that we can talk about and very problematic. Most of the comparisons are from registries and we all know that there are you know, hopelessly confounded issues built into those comparisons. Both balloon expandable and self-expanding technologies do continue to evolve. And you know the most relevant comparison that people would be interested in today in commercial US practice at this brief instant in time would be Sapien S3 versus Evolute R. But the landscape is far from static. Um, and then as a field, as mortality, stroke, et cetera, have declined, other concerns, the sort of ancillary concerns, have started to dominate, including access issues, um, uh, paravalvular leak or aortic regurgitation, durability becomes a concern as we think about lower and lower risk populations and pacemaker rates dominate. Um, and then again, I, I took this from um, Marty Leon who points out that even this self-expanding versus balloon expanding is a false dichotomy. There are numerous platforms that work by um, entirely different principles that are neither balloon expandable nor self-expanding. And so keep your eyes open. This is a brief snapshot and uh, I'll just leave that at that. So what disease are we talking about? Of course, we all know this. We all know that aortic stenosis is one of those diseases that has a long latent period, and then at the time it presents with symptoms, the patients just fall off the cliff of their normal expected survival curve and have very abysmal clinical outcomes as soon as they become symptomatic with an estimated 50% mortality at two years. And we all know that if you can replace that valve, you can create immortality. <laughs> Not really, but you can put the patient back onto a normal survival curve for their age cohort. And I just love the way Blaise Carabella, many of you know him, summarizes this disease in 13 words. It's when, when this hole gets too tight for the blood to come out, you die. And I just think that's, that's it. You have to replace that valve. So the first... Um, Percutaneous effort to do this was, of course, Alain Cribier, who used, of course, a balloon expandable TAVR valve. This is him in France um, toasting with champagne with the very first patient in 2002 following the procedure. This evolved into the first commercial heart valve, the, the original one. Um, it's, as you see, bovine pericardial tissue leaflets, and it's very much designed in terms of the leaflets like a surgical valve with at that time a stainless steel frame and then a skirt to eliminate or to reduce the risk for paravalvular um, regurgitation. So I would just pose this simple question. If you had to decide for your patient or for yourself, would you want a valve that looks a lot like a surgical valve and sits here low profile or would you want this ginormous thing that doesn't even look like a valve? It's for you to decide. 
Um, let's look at the uh, <laughs> let's look at the original um, approval trial for the Sapien, the partner. Um, this is incredibly remarkable. This number needed to treat is one of the lowest you'll see anywhere in clinical medicine. It's less than four patients you have to treat to save a life, which is compared to medical therapy, which is really remarkable, really a game changer. And then if we compare to the patients who were candidates for surgery in that trial, remember it had two major arms, um, there's no difference. So you've got something that's far superior to nothing and uh, at least as good as surgery in that original, with the original generation device. Now, of course, my opponent will, I'm sure, tell you that the core valve also can solve this issue. <coughs> we see here from the core valve approval trial that there's actually a survival benefit with a p-value um, less than 0.04 compared to surgical. But, of course, this is a different cohort. These patients were, did not have as high uh, an STS risk score, and it's really an apples to oranges. But the main message is that these valves um, do save lives. Now, here is um, where some of the debate gets, um, gets uh, important. What are the sort of side issues associated? Um, in this trial, which was, or this meta-analysis, which was admittedly um, with these earlier generation valves and with the original technique, you see that the incidence of requirement for a pacemaker is much higher by numerous authors um, uh, with the core valve than with the sapien. Now, again, these are early generation, but... Um, so, what do we know about head-to-head -head trials? Again, I said there, there was some randomized uh, controlled data. This is um, the CHOICE trial, which was the one-year data was just published in 2015, and already this trial, one could argue, is almost completely irrelevant to the discussion today because these are not the current generation devices that were studied. Nevertheless, it's probably worth just looking very briefly. The uh, success rate, the procedural success, was slightly higher, you see, with the balloon expandable uh, with a significant p-value. And then the clinical outcome uh, at one year, the all-cause mortality, was not statistically different between the two. So perhaps close to a, close to a dead heat with those... Um, to generations of devices. But of course, that has not been, uh, again, a static situation. The, so the balloon expandable valves have continued to evolve. You see the current one, which is now the commercially available Sapien 3, uh, has most importantly uh, a skirt which goes around the bottom of it, uh, which prevents, in large part, the problem of paravalvular leak and has made substantial inroads into that issue. Also, the delivery system has continued to get smaller and smaller. I will say that this breakpoint between the Sapien and the Sapien XT is where most of the patients were falling off the pathway and not qualifying for transfemoral in this era, and most of them qualified once you jump to this era. But there have been even incremental improvements as we move to the 14 French E sheath. So the current valve, as I said, um, has this skirt, which really has made, you know, in most people's experience, including ours, a tremendous difference in that issue of paravalvular leak, which we know is a, a poor prognostic uh, indicator. Um, <clears throat> I've already talked about the access requirement. So um, what do we know about 30-day all-cause mortality as the devices have improved? If you look, this is the, um, the trend as we've gone from the partner trial out to the current generation sapien 3 uh, transfemoral, we have a 1.6 percent 30-day cause mortality, which is really quite remarkable. Um, stroke rate's also low, and if we look at the paravalvular leak issue, again, it's become um, almost, almost unheard of. It's very rare to have severe paravalvular leak problems, moderate or severe, at 30 days. We can go through the other issue is permanent pacemaker. Here it's low, around the 10% range. Um, there have been some changes in technique that have affected both devices and the pacemaker rates. But um, I think overall we look at these numbers now and you kind of say, wow, this is almost 500 patients in this study and an overall 1.6% um, mortality risk and a very low stroke rate, acceptable pacemaker rate, and, and very little paravalvular leak. So, um, it's, it's a very strong case. So I would like to, in, in the remaining couple minutes, show you two cases very quickly that illustrate 
how important it is, um, these, these last couple issues that I just brought up, how important they are. So this was a patient recently, 86-year-old man, who he and his son had both read on the Internet and wanted Sapien 3 by name. They came and asked for it. Um, and he wanted to be awake. So um, we accessed the patient as usual. We pre-closed percutaneously. Uh, we always do an up and over wire to protect the um, primary access site um, during the closure. Put a pigtail in, did an aortogram, and um, this is what it looks like. Um, as we crossed the valve, the patient developed a new left bundle branch block. Okay. We did the hemodynamics, um, put in our interventional wire, did our, we do a second timeout, the AV, introduced the valve, prepared it, delivered, deployed it, as you see here. I'll just let that play. Um, the left bundle persisted, so um, we deployed that valve. Uh, sorry. Um, we did a final aortogram, which you see here. There's really no perceptible um, aortic regurgitation. Valve position is good. Um, hemodynamics, con as I said, confirmed everything. We did a balloon-assisted closure of the access sites, and the total procedure time was about 60 minutes, less than 90 minutes. Um, <coughs> and so that was a pretty clean case, except he had this left bundle. So what ended up happening is he stayed in the hospital um, for, um, he left on post-op day five because of all the discussion about the bundle branch block and should he get a pacer and how long should we keep in a temporary wire and all that sort of thing that happens. And I'll just contrast that, and that was a rare occurrence to have that. But I'll just contrast that with this other recent case. This is a patient who didn't have that issue, 78-year-old man, also wanted to have a wake taver, so got conscious sedation. We did the same things. I just put the times here just to show you. This goes relatively quickly. We get the access in the same way, go up and over, uh, across the valve, do the timeout, the BAV, um, the whole procedure in this, in this with deployment and then closure and everything, again, was less than 90 minutes. And this patient had no bundle branch block no pacer issues, and this is, a, a, because it's a balloon expandable valve, we're not worried that it's continuing to expand and put pressure on the conduction system, and he went home in 48 hours. So, um, sorry, I hadn't let that play. That's the deployment there. It, take, it was a 19 second deployment. So that's it, the case is efficient, it's all percutaneous, and patients are going home. So, um, so I, I think the, the case is now that the dominant issues in TAVR are really related to access. So there's been you know, a shift away from open surgical toward reliable, safe, and percutaneous approaches that reduce the length of stay. Patients ask for it. They demanded it. The ones that have gotten cut downs inevitably complain about it. Um, and I think you heard that even in the EVAR talk, the vascular surgeons are doing uh, percutaneous. Um, some of the anesthesia issues we've had, you know, over the months, patients get bladder infections and so on, and some of that can go away if you do conscious sedation. So um, a paravavular leak, because of this, this skirt, has become less of an issue, and it favors the minimalist approach. And again, the pacemaker, you can say they're not a big deal, but it's the pacemaker angst that really leads to the increased length of stay and not knowing what to do about it. So I would say, definitely, if you tally these things up, it's very clear that even on some of the things where we may tie, the balloon expandable definitely wins. So regardless of the academic trickery and pants on fire statements you will hear in the next 10 minutes, the real winner is really the patient. Thank you very much, Rick. And now uh, we will hear a vigorous defense of the self-expanding uh, TAVR device by uh, Dr. Subhash Banerjee, my chief. Thank you very much. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, what you should unlearn. Uh, <laughs> my disclosures. Rick is an undoubtedly phenomenal expert in this area. And he has brought this phenomenal care to veterans, hundreds and thousands in the West of the United States. And I can discount that. And I take his word uh, for everything he says because I trust him. Let me tell you again that he is also an endurance swimmer. He swims across the bay, and if you know one thing about endurance swimming, that these are precision people. 
They know the time of the day, the tide, the current, and everything about it to reproduce success day after day, month after month, and year after year. So the objective of my talk, again, is summarized by statements from Mark Twain. Swimming against a current, it exhausts you. So after a while, whoever you are, you just have to let go, and the current will bring you home. So Rick, allow me the next five minutes to bring you home. Rick described the two valves, the balloon expandable onto your left and the self-expanding, which released and there is no rapid pacing, there is no urgency to deploy in 19 seconds, because in 19 seconds, it could be deployed right, but also be deployed wrong. Can you correct it? So let me invol in involve you in the discussion. There is incontrovertible evidence of what Rick showed, that transcatheter aortic valve has saved lives, and the balloon expandable Edward Sapien has actually been the first device that we have used in the United States which has been immensely successful. Here are some recent evidence of five-year sustained, sustained results from the Partner 1 trial. Survival, Tower Group, 71.8%. Standard treatment, 93.6%. Uh, people died, and hence the Tower Group did very well. Impressive reduction in readmission and heart failure. Here are some other details. Most of the deaths were accrued over the first two years, and to enroll 358 patients in this balloon expandable stent study, 3,000 patients were screened. Oxygen dependency and most importantly, peripheral artery disease were major predictors of mortality. So the next generation of TAVR devices have tried to solve these two problems, to make this technology more accessible and available to patients and also improve patient safety. Comparators, comparisons. On to the left is the data about self-expanding. On to the right about balloon expanding. Let me tell you that the self-expanding does not require pre-dilatation in most situations. It does not require rapid pacing. Imagine before implanting the valve, you pace the heart rapid in a patient who has got severe aortic stenosis. Rick just told you it can kill you because it increases myocardial oxygen consumption. Deployment in a self-expanding tower valve is very controlled compared to a rapid, hurried, sometimes uh, quick deployment that is required for the balloon expandable. Most importantly, if you malposition it, there is no ability to recapture that valve in a balloon expandable, where that ability does exist for self-expanding valves. The sheath size. There is a true 18 French sheath is required to traverse the peripheral arteries. In the S3, the most recent version, though the sheet size has definitely reduced, they, the, uh, the key word here is expandable. So when the device goes through, the largest dimension of the device expands the sheet, and as it passes through, it again shrinks. So it does expand the artery. As I said also, uh, that, that the peripheral artery disease definitely is one of the biggest challenges. So let me show you how it is. This is, onto your left, is a Cook sheath, 18 French. The outer dimensions, or the outer diameter, includes the thickness of the sheath itself, so it is 22 French. And the self-expanding valve is a true 18 French, 18 French uh, catheter. Here is the data about the self-expanding. So please follow through the three different dimensions of the valves, 23, 26, and 29. The maximal external diameter of the valve when it goes through the sheath and expands the sheath is at the level of the pusher. It is 7.65, 7.64, and 8.18, approved for vessels of 5.5, 5.5, and 6 millimeter dimensions, which gives you a 36% transient, however transient, oversizing. And every vascular surgeon will tell you that that can lead to complications. Risk of embolization with self-expanding, the losing the, the valve, no, zero with self-expanding, yes, the possibility exists. Annular rupture, you can rupture if you misappropriate the size, you can expand the balloon and put a too bigger valve and you can cause the rupture of the aortic annulus. No risk with self-expanding, yes, with balloon expanding. There is, of course, historically been a higher risk of paravalvular leak with the self-expanding. Now, in most recent iterations of that valve, that risk is lower as is, the risk of pacemaker, though historically Rick is right that the pacemaker requirement for self-expanding has been very high. Imagine a patient who has, who has no femoral arteries. Can you go through his subclavian or axillary artery? 
Yes, in self-expanding. No, with balloon expanding. Imagine a patient, 20% of patients with aortic stenosis have atrial fibrillation. Imagine a patient has a left atrial clot. You want to do TAVR. If you rapid pace him and you pace terminate him, you can put him into sinus rhythm and cause distal embolization from the left atrial appendage clot. That risk does not exist because you can deploy a self-expanding valve without the requirement of rapid pacing. Even the manufacturer of the, self, of the balloon expanding valve is moving to a next generation valve that has got the ability to recapture. So Rick, uh, and, uh, and the two new upcoming valves in the United States are all self-expanding in platform. They are not balloon expanding. So in terms of the study that Rick showed, choice trial with self-expanding, uh, where the device success rate of balloon expanding is higher, let me also mention that the one-year stroke rate with the balloon expanding was 9.1% with 3.4% valve thrombosis. Overall, no difference in mortality. So Rick, the take-home message for all of you is self-expanding valves allows us to treat more patients. It can provide enhanced safety features for self-expanding platform and has, and has made it the go-to platform for the current and next generation's tower. And for you, Rick, the message, swim with the current. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>